In order to find my way to ancient Rome, I had to go to Kathmandu. This was about three or four years ago. The trip had taken me 30, 40 years of study. And I found myself in the city in the, in the high mountains, short of the Himalayas, wandering as a tourist would wander, and suddenly looked about myself on a street close to the center of town and said, I'm finally there. I'm in ancient Rome. What I meant by that was I suddenly realized I'd been lucky enough not to find the streets where all the trekkers bought their equipment, not to find the street with the Barnes and Noble bookshop that had no relationship to Mr. Barnes or Mr. Noble whatsoever, but instead in a perfectly ordinary kind of old-fashioned street in downtown Kathmandu. A very narrow street with old jerry-built buildings towering over it. You looked up four stories and it almost looked as if the two buildings would come together at the top, leaning into the street. Open on ground level for retail of every possible kind, on the upper floors, residential. Wherever the streets opened up just a little bit, you'd find a produce market or a clothing market or something, people buying and selling. And when it came into a slightly more open space, you'd find a curious kind of building. Uh, one that I remember well was maybe twice the size of this large table in front of me. It was made of bronze. It had fancy fenertilations on the roof. It had bells hanging there, flowers hanging in various ways. Off to one side, a woman sitting in front of trays of lighted candles. And people would come and take a lighted candle and put it somewhere on the framework of this little building. All speaking, uh, not speaking, uh, very serious. Um, going about their business, not making eye contact with other people, but just doing something that didn't seem to have any immediate practical purpose. I walked down another narrow lane, found myself in a larger square where there were some rather grander buildings that also seemed a little short of purpose. But the one that preoccupied me was the one off to one corner about the size of a telephone booth. It too was made of metal, it had an opening in the front and sort of grill openings on the side. A little line of people outside. And everyone who came along, it seemed, would stop and get in line, and then wait their turn to go into the front door opening of this. Let me pull this down, see if it works better. Um, to go into the front door opening of this and bend down or kneel down, make some gesture, I couldn't quite make out what it was, and then turn again, not making eye contact, and walk away. Now, some of the people were traditionally dressed. I remember one very well-dressed looking Western style businessman, say 60 years old. Um, and then a young couple who were maybe 20 years old. Uh, they were more fashionably dressed, he in Western styles, she in South Asian styles, but just a little flashier and a little tighter and a little more trimly cut than most of the other women you saw in Kathmandu. And they took turns and then they conversed briefly and walked off in another direction. Well, I knew I was working on this book and thinking about it and I started to get excited. I said, here it is, the real thing, ancient Rome. This is what it must have been like. I'm so excited. And then I realized that I was the only excited one. But for all the people who were passing to and fro in this space, what I was excited by was somehow ordinary and everyday and natural and normal and just a part of life. So then I started looking at my own reactions and I realized that I had very quickly decided what you've probably decided from my description, that what I was looking at were manifestations of religious behavior. But then I started to ask myself the question, just how do I know that? And what category is it that I'm applying to this? I hadn't read my guidebooks very well. I didn't know much about religious behavior in that part of the world. But I was ready to identify in a large box I call religion, a box in which other actions of mine also fit somewhere else in the corner, uh, in which other actions of other friends and neighbors and colleagues of mine fit in other parts of the box. I was identifying this behavior that I saw that was puzzling and in some important sense, without interpretation, meaningless. By meaningless I mean that when I saw people buying vegetables, I knew what they were doing. When I saw a workman go by carrying a mattress on his back, I knew what he was doing. When I saw somebody go into a small phone booth and kneel down and bow down and stand up and go in another direction, 
I didn't have the same immediate sense of what the meaning of that could be, except that I brought the category with me. Let me let you pause on that for a moment and think about what it was, is like to encounter the phenomena of religious behavior in a different kind of society. And picture me, uh, the gawky, pale American wandering around Kathmandu, thinking myself to be the observer, the outsider, the other. Then imagine that you were something like the front desk clerk at the Grand Hyatt in Kathmandu. And this strange Western tourist has come along and is taking beanie baby elephants out of the, the shopping bag he's carrying and posing them around the lobby. He seems to be bowing in front of them, maybe even talking to them. Sit up straight, guys, that sort of thing. And takes pictures of them. I wonder if the desk clerk wondered for himself whether he wasn't seeing the leading edge of some curious new Western religious cult uh, whose devotees were now going to be flocking through Kathmandu uh, doing their own parody of local religion. He'd surely seen Westerners uh, who had their own take on his local religion sometime before. My point in going through this story for now is to emphasize the way in which what we think and know and say about religious behavior in, time, in various times and places is heavily determined by who we are, what our own background is, and by the deeply rooted patterns of Western thinking on these subjects. So I want to talk today a little bit about the deep roots of those Western patterns. I'm going to go back 2,000 years to tell a story of one of the most famous moments in the history of ancient religion. On the night of the 31st of May in the year 17 BC, there began a three-day festival that was called the Games of the Century, Ludi Seculares. 17 BC, to refresh for you, is 27 years after the death of Julius Caesar. It's 10 years after the final elevation to the rank of Augustus of Gaius Julius Octavianus. He has now been the supreme and unchallenged master of the Roman world for 14 years. He would be so again for another 31 years. The wisest and best thing that Augustus indeed ever did as a ruler was live to a ripe old age. If an influenza bug had caught Augustus in 33 or 25 or 18 BC, uh, the history of the world might have been very different. But by the time he lived to a ripe old age and died in 14 AD, the world that he lived in had forgotten how to fight civil wars and was ready to accept dynastic succession as a reasonable way to continue the power that he had exercised in some form or another for over half a century. But in 17 BC, the games of the century were very much the event of the city of Rome in that uh, in that coming summer. The story was simple and straightforward. The games of the century went back to a celebration that had taken place at least twice before, probably in 249 and 149 BC. There was a story about the man from up the Tiber who had had a sick child and was going to placate the gods and he'd been told he had to go to Tarentum to find them so he was sailing down the Tiber and then he'd have to sail down through the Tyrrhenian Sea and around through the Scylla and Charybdis to find Tarentum on the boot of Italy. But as he's passing the site of the city of Rome at some relatively early date, he asks people, what name, what's the name of this neighborhood we find ourselves in? And they said, Tarentum. They were pointing to the muddy bank of the Tiber up around the bend where Castel Sant'Angelo, Hadrian's tomb, now stands. He took this as a sign, so he got out, and he sacrificed there to the gods of the underworld, praying to the gods of the underworld that they spare his child. And they did. And this was remembered, and so the gods of the underworld were cultivated on that spot. And every century or so, the games of the century would take place. The idea behind the games of the century, more or less century, was that they should be spaced so far apart that no living human being would ever see them twice. Whether you were a child or old man, you'd see them once, and another, usually about 110 years, would pass before the games would be mounted again. So on May 31st of 17 BC, Augustus Caesar, uh, with his colleague and successor designate not to be, Marcus Agrippa, presided over the games of the century on three consecutive nights and days in the old location of the Tarentum, uh, there at the far end of the Campus Martius, and then also on the Palatine and Capitoline Hills in the center of the city of Rome. 
This was all part, we are widely and roundly told, of Augustus' desire to revive Roman religion, which had fallen on hard times in the past century, and that by the revival of Roman religion and appropriate service to the gods, peace and good order of the Roman world would once again be restored. The particular rituals to be conducted we know a great deal about because of two lucky survivals. One is a very large stone inscription from right at the site, at the Tarentum, of the Ludi Saeculares themselves, which contain the documents of the case, uh, the proceedings of the College of Priests, a description of what happened, uh, meticulously documenting that this had happened. Another writer about 500 years later, with the benefit of further hindsight and some surviving documents, tells us the story in a consistent way, filling in some of the other details. So we can reconstruct with great precision what happened for those three days and three nights. Remember, this was reviving the sacrifice to the gods of the underworld to protect the lives and health and safety of Romans. But by the time Augustus got through, it was just a little bit different. He knew what he was doing because he and his fellow members of the college of 15 men in charge of sacrifices, the Quindicem Viri Sacris Faciundis, had consulted the Sibylline books, the books of the oracles of the Sibyls, which had been kept meticulously in Roman temples for many centuries. Okay, there was one small problem. There had been this little fire in 83 BC, and the books had actually been destroyed. But they'd put some together some new books, and okay, they weren't in the Temple of Jupiter Capitoline anymore. They were in the house temple of Augustus himself on the Palatine. But they really were, trust me, uh, the authentic books. And going to these oracular books gave you the authentic direction for what you should be doing, or not, as the case may be. By the time Augustus gets through making preparations for the sacrifices, the panel of gods has been changed slightly. They begin with night sacrifices, the time for sacrificing to the gods of the underworld. Begin, instead of sacrificing uh, to the gods of the underworld, begin with sacrifices to the fates. The moira, the Greek word for it, not the parkai, the more familiar Latin word. Followed the next day by sacrifices to Jupiter, the next night by sacrifices to the goddesses of childbearing, called ilithii. And like Moirai, that's not exactly the usual word Romans used for those goddesses. And then Juno. And then on the last day, finally, Apollo and Diana. The last day, in particular, is a celebration of gods of light and plenty. Uh, Apollo is a god who brings plague, but also protects you from plague. Uh, Diana, the virgin huntress goddess, is a goddess of plenty in her own way. And on that last morning on the Palatine Hill, south facing to the bright light of morning. 27 chosen young boys and 27 chosen young girls sang in unison a great hymn in honor of all the gods, but especially Apollo and Diana. That hymn happens to survive because it was written by the poet Horace at the behest of Augustus. It's called the Carmen Saecolare, the song of the century, something like that. When they finished, they then went over to the Capitoline Hill, the Temple of Jupiter, and they repeated the song. If you have any of you have ever seen the opera Die Meistersinger by Wagner, you know the last scene takes place outside the city of, uh, of Nuremberg and is in a, a golden glade in which bright summer day and happy, bright, dressed in white people are singing their little hearts out with beautiful joy at the wonderfulness of, okay, slightly unfortunately phrased, the holy German people. But it's a representation of a celebration of light and brightness and air and optimism and power. Somehow or another, that's what happened with the games of the century. Little noticed fact, but the choice of the dates on which the games of the century took place was very carefully arranged for exactly that purpose. May 31st, 1st, and 2nd of June. On those days in the year 17, the full moon was just coming full on the night of the 31st of May. And of course, the sun was reaching the longest day of the year in the middle of June. Those three nights and days were the brightest, lightest days of the year. And if you're going to be doing nighttime sacrifice in Rome in 17 BC, a bright full moon rising in the east and spending the night in the sky gives you as much illumination as you could ever possibly imagine. Nothing spooky, nothing underworld god about these celebrations. Uh, and the movement starting from the fates and ending with Apollo and Diana mimicked the emerging brightness of the moon and the sun in that time and place. 
This was the bright dawning of a new age that was being incorporated and enacted and presented in these sacrifices. There are lots of political undertones to this. One reason why these games took place then and in this way was because the highest office in Roman religion at the time, the office of Pontifex Maximus, the one still held by a senior religious dignitary who lives not far from the Tarentum in Rome. That office was held by the last of the old triumvirs, Lepidus, who was living in retirement outside the city of Rome and being old and cranky and not showing up very often. Augustus wanted that job but couldn't get it, finally got it when Lepidus died in 12, a few years later. The games of the century show every sign of being Augustus' ingenious discovery of the best way he could imagine to produce a religious spectacle which would carry the message of his administration and ennoble both himself and his colleague Agrippa, whom he very much hoped would be his successor or the father of his successor in his, uh, in his time. This was revival of Roman religion in one sense, but it was also a transformation of Roman religion for very contemporary political, practical, social purposes in order to achieve the ends that Augustus saw in the society around him. It turns out the idea was a success. Uh, the huge inscription was probably one piece of transmitting this idea forward. Horace's poem was another. We know of at least five later occasions on which the games of the century were celebrated. Um, they got out of whack on counting a little bit, so they took place in 47 and 88. Okay, somebody could have seen that twice. And then in 148, and then in 204, and then in 248. Um, this sort of thing happens. When uh, Alden and I were at the University of Pennsylvania, we well knew that the, the 250th anniversary of the founding of the institution was coming in the early 1990s, by which we meant the 250th anniversary of the founding of the small secondary school for boys that Ben Franklin started in downtown Philadelphia in 1740-something or other. Um, either the University of Pennsylvania was 250 years old, or we needed a really good excuse for a party. And we figured out how to make that good excuse, uh, and in the process, canonized Ben Franklin as our ancestor for the institution that we were, um, that we were part of. So let me step back. As customarily told, the story of the games of the century is that story of the revival of Roman religion. Modern research, unfortunately, does not demonstrate that there was a significant decline of Roman religion in the first century BCE. That's one small fact. But the larger fact is that no amount of modern research can deal with the fact that worrying about whether Roman religion was rising or falling is extraneous to the concerns of a historian, at best a concern for politicians of that period, and not even clearly a concern for the politicians of that period. The religious needs, such as they were, of Roman people were somehow being met. Plenty of sacrifice, plenty of religious activity was taking place in that city, uh, up and down the countryside, in the homes, around the ancestral hearths uh, for the native gods and goddesses. Uh, the Temple of Jupiter, yes, it had burned down, but it had been re-erected. Uh, Jupiter presided from the Capitoline Hill. All was, by all reasonable evidence, well in heaven, but Augustus wanted you to think otherwise. Augustus had a program for his own purpose of using the language and the gestures and the symbols and even the history of religion in order to pursue his own contemporary projects. There was no real revival of Roman religion in this period, but there was establishment of lots of religious activities and organizations, lots of funding of religious activities and organizations. But we never tell the history of religion as a history of money. We tell it as a history of theology and cult and practice. But the history of money in Roman religion is much more important than I think it has been made out to be. Roman religion, to be sure, continues to thrive and prosper for a long time. Uh, to talk about paganism and to talk about what becomes of Roman religion, I need to get to a period when it does not thrive and prosper. But remember the history for a moment that from Augustus forward, for a good 200 years, the Roman Empire was as rich as any organization on the planet had ever figured out how to be. When it found its wealth sagging in some way or another, Roman generals and armies found someone to beat up, someone's property to take, some other riches to bring back to the city of Rome. When Edward Gibbon says that the second century AD was the best and most prosperous period in the history of ancient, uh, of ancient times, 
he meant that it was for those who were in positions of power and authority in the city of Rome an extraordinarily comfortable and elegant time uh, to be alive, depending on the work of slaves, uh, on the work of women, and on the produce of many others whose possessions had been plundered to bring them to Rome. It's not an accident uh, that maybe the most successful of the Roman emperors, the Antonine emperors, existed precisely in the period when, for the first time in almost 200 years, a large new province had been added to the Roman Empire, Dacia, modern Romania. The addition of a large new province meant large amounts of new plunder and booty to be brought back to the center from the margins, and therefore a fine and prosperous time for Romans of all kinds. The third century AD, the 200s, was a period when the wheels came off the Roman cart in many dramatic ways. Between 235 and 284 AD, something like 50 odd people, you can't really do an accurate count, represented themselves to be emperor of Rome, the longest serving of whom lasted about seven years, and the only reason he lasted that long was because nobody bothered to go and chase him down and kill him. Uh, he was in his own province off in one part of the world, and others were busy beating up on each other elsewhere. That period of the third century was a period when, on the economic level, Roman religion therefore suffered. Dollars, not dollars, but funding for religious buildings, religious cults, religious activities, religious personnel, all fell, as did the overall economic level of the Roman world. There are also fashions in religion. The ancient Romans, call them the Romans from 500 BC to the time of Augustus, had their own ways of dealing with the future through taking auspices and omens, examining the entrails of beasts. By the time of the late Republic, some of those practices had literally become a joke. To say that you were going to be taking the omens, studying the sky to see if the flights of birds had any messages to offer, was a recognized way of bringing public business to a halt because it was recognized that whoever went to take the omens, if he wanted to find some negative omen, would surely do so. And therefore, nothing could happen until the magistrate who was taking the omens had decided to relent. Uh, the practices of Roman government in the first century BC resemble some of those of American government in the first decade of the 21st century AD. With that fraying of respect for old forms, new forms did in fact emerge. Astrology is a practice that runs deep into the ancient Mideast, uh, is deeply planted in Greek culture, but becomes popular and widely practiced in Roman culture, precisely at the point when other more old-fashioned ways of knowing about the future tended to drift into disrepute and fade away. There was nothing abnormal, nothing unnatural about this, and certainly no reason why a modern historian should regret that old practices of taking omens had faded, while other ways of manipulating the future equally full of their own humbug, had replaced them. By the end of the third century, the wheels came back on the Roman car. The Emperor Diocletian, taking office in 284 AD, managed to reestablish military and political authority over all the territory of the old Roman Empire. That province of Dacia, Romania, had fallen away, but the rest of the empire was in one piece. The centralization of the Roman Empire, the centralization of authority in the Roman Empire, the establishment of a large military bureaucracy and the mechanism to support it uh, was brought to new heights of strength and power in the last years of the third and the first years of the fourth century. It is reasonable to argue that the fourth century uh, was probably the most prosperous period in the history of the Roman Empire for the most people. The only period that outruns it in any region is the period between 430 and 530 in North Africa when the so-called Vandals had taken control of North Africa. That turned out to be far and away the most prosperous period in the history of North Africa because they stopped paying taxes to Rome and discovered just how rich they had been. They thought they had been rich before, but when they could stop paying taxes, they discovered they were indeed the richest province anywhere. That late prosperity runs against some stories about decline and fall of Rome, and those stories are being revised in a variety of ways. But our interest today is in the religious history of this period. One of the things that most people know about this period is that in the year 312, the Emperor Constantine, one of the immediate successors of Diocletian, had a vision just before a battle at the Milvian Bridge outside Rome when he was fighting another one of the contenders for supremacy in the Roman Empire. 
a vision in which something happened that involved a cross. There are some conflicting versions that survive from his, from his time and from his, his publicists. Um, if you see a logo of a cross uh, being held on a shield you know, with a banner underneath it saying, in this sign you shall conquer, what you are actually looking at is the coat of arms of the O'Donnell family registered in the 16th century and in its own way registering the legend of Constantine's vision from, 15, from 1,200 years earlier. We tell the story of the conversion of Constantine to Christianity and the conflict between paganism and Christianity in this period as though it were a contest to the death between competing isms that recognize each other and fought it out to the end. The story is unfortunate, as we receive it, is unfortunately uh, not especially true. I need to talk a little bit about paganism, the word paganism, in order to make this clear. Paganus is the Latin word that we start from when we talk about paganism. It had a history before it got involved in religion because pagus was a word for a country district, um, a place where farmers lived, a place with a few small villages at best and mainly farmers. Paganus is a person who lives there. By one line of etymology, in fact, the modern word peasant in English comes from paganus, and that's a rough and ready translation of what the word would have meant in its original acceptation in ancient times. But it gets picked up and drawn into re religious use around the year 200 by Christians who had a particular rhetorical point to make. Their point was that the true Christian was a soldier of Christ, a miles Christi. In a world in which Christians were reluctant to serve in the real army, reluctant to be milites, uh, there was a nice rhetorical point to be made there. We aren't soldiers in your way, we are true soldiers. Now in the Roman world of around 200, soldiers worked mainly on the frontiers. Uh, they defended the frontiers and borders against incursions from across those territories. Uh, they were increasingly not mobile, but increasingly resident in the places where they defended, places like Hadrian's Wall in northern Britain. And they were acutely aware, and I know this from, as it happens, military upbringing myself, of the distance between themselves and the locals. We called them civilians when I was a kid. What the Roman soldiers called them were Pagani, the peasants, the locals. So when the re Christian religious use of this term was picked up, it was picked up to say that in the great conflict of God and Satan, you were either a Miles Christi or a Paganus, a civilian, a peasant, a loser, something outside the charm circle. Okay, nice rhetorical point. Um, if somebody understands what you're saying, you can get how that would, would motivate a few good sermons and be part of a colloquial vocabulary. The growth of Latin literature in Christianity was slow and episodic. The third century was a bad century in a variety of ways, as I've said. Not much Christian literature was written in that time. Not much was in Latin. Not much was read. In the fourth century, on the other hand, in that new prosperity that I described, there was a boom in Christianity for a variety of reasons. One was simply the boom in the world they found themselves in. And the second was the boom that came when a powerful emperor, Constantine, decided that it was time to promote the Christian God because the Christian God had, after all, seen him into and out of battle. And so Christian readers of that period came upon this word paganus being used 200 years earlier and couldn't quite make sense of it, but that didn't slow them down. They looked at it hard and they figured they knew what it meant. Got it. Paganus, person from the country district. I've got it. People in country districts are slower to convert to Christianity than people who live in cities. Therefore, we'll call people who don't convert to Christianity Pagani. The Miles Christi, the soldier of Christ part, had dropped away. And what was left instead was Christians versus pagans. And the particular rhetorical point now was that the people to whom this term was being applied were not peasants. They were the people in the cities many of them wealthy, many of them powerful, many of them of good families, who persisted in their practice of the traditional religious uh, observances of the city of Rome. And it's clear uh, from a variety of their patterns of use that Christian readers and writers decided that calling these people peasants was a good way to get their goat. It was a functional way to define a category, but it was a good way to irk the people who lived in that category. One of our signs of this is that when books are written by people who use the word paganos, 
that are actually addressed to people who might convert from something else to Christianity, the word is not used. We're polite then. But when we're talking to each other among us Christians, then we talk about those pagans outside. You may recognize the practice from a variety of forms of modern, uh, of modern insult and offense. But what exactly does Paganus mean in that case? It means people who are not like us, it's a, and particularly people who are not like us by virtue of their religious activities and practices. That's all it means by the time the Christians get through with it. There are other words for people who are not Christian, uh, words that can go back to scripture. Paganus has no basis in scripture whatsoever. But the, the ancient Jews spoke of the nations outside. Why do the nations furiously rage? Those nations become the Gentiles in Judaism. Uh, gentiles, outsiders, is a relatively neutral term for people who live somewhere else and practice a different kind of religion. And they live somewhere else and practice a different kind of religion in a world in which it doesn't matter that they do so. This is the religious pride and superiority of a group which knows it has the right form of religion and doesn't much care about all those people who don't have the right form of religion. They are simply the outsiders and the others. What emerges gradually in Christianity of late antiquity, and there are many long controversies over why this should be the case, is not only the assertion that Christianity has the superior form of religion, but that everyone who does not have that superior form of religion should acquire it. And at that point, the label for being an unchristian, a paganus, needs to carry us a zing, needs to carry a kick, needs to be a reminder that you are on the outside of something that you should really try to be on the inside from. That's a change. And it's a historic change in the shaping and making of late antique Christianity. The story of the fourth century is in many respects the story of the invention and triumph of the concept of paganism. I don't mean to say that pagan religious practices grew. I mean that the idea of talking about religious practice as though it were pagan or otherwise grew and became very successful. Constantine represents the first great success in this regard. Constantine is, in many, many respects, a perfectly ordinary Roman emperor of the traditional pagan variety. A god appeared to him in a dream and said, if you wear my badge, your guys will win this next battle. That was an old-fashioned kind of Roman religious bargain. Constantine struck the bargain. His guys won the battle. And so they kept wearing the badge. And Constantine, as a good Christian, well, well, a good something or other, decided he'd spend a little money on this god. If this god had been good to him, he was going to stay with this god. So Constantine starts building churches. He starts patronizing the clergy of the Christian church. He starts taking some money away from other religious, other religious organizations in order to have money to give to the Christians. He starts, or does not start, banning certain kinds of religious practices. A lot of debate about this, but the convincing evidence is that the religious practices that Constantine actually banned were the ones that were directed most openly against himself or other emperors. Nocturnal sacrifices have always been unpopular with emperors. It was a kind of thing you did to try to get bad gods uh, to help you against good powers. Uh, astrology was bad news because casting the emperor's horoscope was a way of finding out that the emperor didn't have long to live and encouraging other people to think that way. Constantine creates a world in which Christianity is religion number one. When he dies in 337 AD, taking baptism on his deathbed, rather to the scandal of many, he left behind a world in which th this emperor had had his number one god and had favored that number one god abundantly. That that number one God came with already a relatively well-organized and coherent community of followers, gave that community of followers an advantage. It was an advantage they never let up on. I said that deathbed baptism was a bit of a scandal. There were two things which people who weren't impressed with Christianity said more often than anything else about Christianity in late antiquity. Uh, the first was that the Christians were all atheists because in a world with many, many gods, they went around denying all but one of them. No one else did that. We can call them atheists. And second, they were immoral. 
because they had this notion that you could enter this saving bath at some time late in your life and all the ills of your past life could go away. Reasonable, well-bred ladies and gentlemen knew they had to behave responsibly and properly throughout all the days of their lives, but there were too many Christians of that period, as a matter of fact, who chose to defer baptism until the last moment of life, and that was taken as a sign of people who had every intention in their religious community, their Christian religious community, of not behaving well until that moment uh, and taking advantage of the bath in order to be, uh, to be cleansed at the last instant. Constantine, I'm saying, was in many respects a very traditional, very pagan kind of emperor who happened to favor the Christians. What the Christians made of that opportunity is another story. One of the first things a young Christian prince made of that opportunity was a concrete form of paganism. One of the things that the Emperor Constantine and his family were good at doing was killing each other. Uh, this is a feature of many successful dynasties in many kinds of empires around the world. Uh, Constantine and his sons had in fact taken care of all of their sisters, cousins, aunts, brothers, and so forth, except for two young cousins who were sent to a castle in Central Asia Minor to be brought up by a bishop, Gallus and Julian. When the last surviving of, of Constantine's sons discovered that he was not up to the task of defending all the Roman Empire himself, he decided he could trust these young cousins you know, to come and help him. He went first to the older of the two, Gallus, um, generally spoken of as Gallus the Thug. Um, he lasted for a couple of years. Um, he was one of the most brutal generals and wannabe emperors of that period. Um, he was put to death. And so, shrugging reluctantly, um, Constantius went instead to the younger cousin, uh, the cousin Julian. Uh, there's actually a parallel story here in contemporary Syrian politics. Um, Hafez al-Assad gets to be Constantine. There was an older brother to the present president who was the thug. And the present president is the ophthalmologist turned president turning thug uh, as, we, as we watch. Julian is the Bashar al-Assad of his, of his time. But Julian was a young man and the first man ever to come to the Roman throne who had been brought up strictly as a Christian from his earliest days. He had been brought up in a religious house by a bishop as a Christian. Okay, so he had some adolescent revolt issues. Who doesn't? It turns out that his adolescent revolt issues were revulsion against the religion that his brutal uh, grandfather had inflicted upon the family. He studied for a year or so in Athens and there decided that he would fall in love with the old religious ways. And he proceeded to build a new religion out of the old religious ways. He called it Hellenism. It meant the revival of all the ancient practices. I talked about Augustus and revival partly to make the point here that when you revive old practices, you do not necessarily recreate the world in which the old practices lived. Uh, Julian was criticized by many traditionalists for the hundreds and thousands of animals he led to sacrifice. Because when we weren't looking in the second and third century, particularly in the third century when money was hard to come by, blood sacrifice had widely gone out of favor inside the Roman world, as one can well imagine that it might. But Julian knew that true restoration of true religion meant lots and lots of butchered cattle and sheep in public on festival days. People made fun of Julian. Julian only lasted as emperor for two and a half years. He decided he could be the new Alexander the Great and go off and conquer the Persians. He did everything Alexander the Great did except conquer the Persians. Uh, and he died even younger than Alexander did in battle on the frontier. He had made such a show of his religion that 50 years later, a Christian writer about him said that his last words had to have been, we kissed Galilei, thou hast conquered, O Galilean. Well, he almost certainly never said that. But what's striking about his life and death is that he got so little take up for his ideas. Um, a traditional form of story about him has been that he tried to revive the old pagan ways. But what everyone has always consciously and almost deliberately, it seems to me, overlooked is that when he died, people of traditional religious practices standing around at the, at the scene of his death, the senior officers of the Roman Empire, selected a Christian to replace him. Religion was not, in fact, the most important category in their mind, and Julian's own religious ideas were not uppermost in the eyes of his contemporaries. In fact, Julian had been remaking paganism in the shape of Christianity. 
patronizing its clergy. Um, he admired the way Christians practiced charity and gathered together uh, money and goods and offerings for the poor. So he decided that the pagans would have to do that as well. Julian was beginning the business of turning traditional religion into the paganism that Christians attacked. He had so far believed what he had been brought up in that when he abandoned what he was brought up in, he couldn't abandon it for what was really traditional, but rather for a new model of what might be a parody of what was traditional. 30 years after Julian, the Emperor Theodosius in 391, uh, himself now brought up uh, as a Christian in Spain in very pious surroundings. He is the one who finally bans traditional religious practices, including all forms of sacrifice, closes the temples, and turns a blind eye when bands of roving monks and zealots would go through Roman cities, destroying temples uh, and seizing property uh, that had been built up over many years in traditional Roman religious and Greek and Roman religious sites. And the reaction to this throughout the Roman world, almost none. It wasn't simply the military and police power of the empire. It was rather the willingness of Romans to practice religion in whatever form seemed best in the place they found themselves. And this Christian God, after all, had turned out on the most traditional of possible interpretations to be a mighty God. And so if all of the other temples were closed and the only other temples that were left open were those of the Christian God, a reasonable and prudent citizen of late antiquity would show up in those places on Sunday for sure because that was a God who had heat big medicine and with whom you had better not get on the outs. And if you knew you needed religious protection, that was the place you could find it. And it turns out that the market was satisfied. To an extraordinary extent, those Christian leaders of the fourth and early fifth century who determined that it was time to compel the others to enter, to require the wedding guests to enter the feast in the gospel language, prevailed because what they offered was a persuasive and convincing line of connection to divine power and authority. Just how much any individual convert to Christianity was willing or unwilling, knowing or unknowing, is very hard to see at this different distance. We should not over obsess for that. What we should back up and look at instead is the set of underpinnings of that category pagan once again. What the Christians who used that term said about themselves was that they were different. When they said that in the fourth century, the world in which they lived was a hard place in which to prove that Christians were much different from those who had gone before them. Yes, they did not practice blood sacrifice, but many people were getting quite comfortable with not practicing blood sacrifice. Yes, they had particular and distinctive books, but the Jews had most of the same books that they did. Yes, they believed in a God of love, but they also believed in praying to a God of love to look after them and protect them and make them well, or to his saints to help make them well. What emerged in the fifth century the Christianity that was transformed in the age of Constantine and his successors was a Christianity that had succeeded in part by being true to its roots and in part by meeting the expectations and the needs of a Roman world that was still in many respects the Roman world that it had been for several hundred years. The decisive feature was not in the fact of transformation but in the claim of transformation. Now that claim lives on and a claim asserted often enough and long enough and hard enough begins to be true in many ways, of course. The Christianity that then particularly went beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire, most influentially northwest uh, to uh, Britain, to Ireland, to Germany, was a Christianity that didn't know how to be anything except a dominant religion and took on that role very happily. It's striking that much of the theological development of Christianity in the early Middle Ages, both East and West, takes place outside the traditional boundaries of the Roman Empire, outside the cockpit of argument between tradition and innovation that Christianity had flourished in. The emergence of Christianity as we know it in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries AD is thus facilitated by and made real by the power of self-differentiation that the Christians brought to what they were doing. 
And my point here is to emphasize the way in which that self-differentiation is an often unacknowledged fact in telling these kind of stories. What's left behind, however, are some critical ambiguities. The story that Christians told about the past in the second century, in the fourth century, in the sixth century, in the 16th century, in the 20th century, are stories about that inside and outside. One of the striking features of Christianity is that it expects you to think about inside and outside and about before and after. Christian dating systems and the Muslim dating system which imitates the Christian dating system are the first ones that don't simply have a beginning but have a before the beginning who count backwards to know what went on before. Because something that was real and true and powerful and valid took place before as well as after that moment. And all across the planet today, uh, people of every religious persuasion know how to use the calendar of before and after, whether they accept the implicit theological doctrines or not. 1 BC to 1 AD was not in fact night and day, it was twilight and daylight. It was anticipation and realization. It was something and then something even better. I want to end by asking you all a few questions. And I'm going to take a show of hands on a few of these questions now in this context. It's supposed to be a question and answer period at the end of these talks. Um, and I'd like to turn the tables just a little bit. Let's start with this one. Do you believe that when ancient people worshiped gods, things they called gods, that they were worshiping actual beings of non-human nature who had powers which they could employ in order to persuade, to help, to punish human beings. How many of you believe that such beings existed in antiquity? Small show of hands. How many believe that they did not exist? Larger show of hands. Those of you in the larger show of hands need to know that you are out of step with ancient Christianity on that point. The ancient Christians uh, very consistently believed that their God was far and away the best God, but they knew well that there were other gods. Uh, whoever wrote the text of Sinai talking about having no strange gods ahead of me believed there were other gods. A particular hang-up for many early Christians were Pharaoh's magicians. Do you remember Pharaoh's magicians, Moses and Aaron showing off? The technical point on which the Christians slowed down was this one. Moses and Aaron were great magicians, no question. But where did Pharaoh's magicians get their mojo? They had something going for them. They worshipped false gods and they had power from that. In its most developed form, and it takes several centuries for this, Christians come to the view that the pagan gods were really the fallen angels. That the fallen angels became demons. They still had quasi, para, semi-divine powers. We can say they still had some mojo. And so they would roam through the world seducing people into thinking that they were gods when they were really petty fallen angels with a little bit of black magic. But they really did exist. Let me take that one step further. If you think that they did not exist, then do you think the stories, I won't embarrass you with a show of hands on this, were the stories that were told about the gods, plural, really just well-intentioned attempts to talk about the one true God? Or were these people simply mistaken? Um, to answer that question, I would encourage you to go to the first chapter of the book of Romans and see there where Paul says that all men had the ability to detect from the natural things of creation the fact and existence of divine, the fact and existence of divine power, but that the others, the ones who were not like himself, got it wrong, didn't know what to do. They knew that God existed, but they worshiped him in false ways. At that point, and on that story, the gods don't exist, but rather they are created in the imagination of men as failed attempts to worship the god of Christianity. Or were all of the stories told about divinity and divinities in antiquity really attempts to describe a pan-human experience of religion, which other different people have different names to use? 
one of the so-called pagan sages of the late fourth century, seeking to find a little place for some of his practices in an increasingly Christian world, said to an emperor who was very Christian that after all, you cannot approach so great a mystery as divinity by any single pathway. His argument was that all of the pathways were valid pathways to approach what was divine and that you might argue about which valid pathway was better or which was worse. Christians were curiously willing to accept that, uh, that view. Now I could ask you whether the gods of Kathmandu exist or not and that's another whole story for our time. But let me slow down over these last questions. Think about them. Do Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same God? I think you can work through what the argument is in favor of saying yes, and I think you can work through the argument in favor of saying no. But while you're thinking of that one, let me push this. In the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries, there was deep debate among Christian theologians that led to the emergence of views which are represented under the names of Nestorianism, Monophysitism, and Chalcedonianism. These are three different representations of theology about the being of Christ. The Nestorians held that two-ishness prevailed. That is to say, there were two people and two beings that Jesus somehow as seen on earth was a human being possessed by a divine spirit and so was really two rather than one. The Monophysite is the one who holds that one-ishness prevails, uh, that whatever you saw in this world in Jesus' lifetime was a single being, uniquely divine and uniquely special. The Chalcedonian view that prevailed held that two and one equal one another, that there were two persons and uh, two, sorry, one, one person and two natures in Jesus, that the divine and the human combined in a particular sort of way. Do Nestorians, Chalcedonians, and Monophysites worship the same God when they define the God so differently and were so often at loggerheads with one another? Do Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, and Presbyterians, and Episcopalians all worship the same God? I suspect this room is probably likely to angle towards saying yes on that one, but then what if I say Mormons? Does that get to be a political question? Well, maybe it does now, but I will stay within my own tradition just to observe that it is quite remarkable that though the Mormon Church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Roman Catholic Church manages its relations with Mormonism through the Ministry for Non-Christian Religions and does not recognize Roman, uh, Mormon baptism. And considering the wars that were fought in the 4th, 5th, and 6th century over baptism and the inappropriateness of rebaptism in any circumstances whatsoever, the official Roman position from a thousand years ago had been that baptism once applied by anyone is baptism and is not to be repeated under any circumstances that the Vatican today says that Mormons coming to Catholicism need to be rebaptized says something quite striking about the cult and the religion. Well, let me be a man from Mars for a moment and say, I'm not sure how you tell the difference between Methodist, Catholic, and Mormon when they all say they're worshiping Jesus Christ, whether some of them are worshiping the same God and some of them are not worshiping uh, that same God. I point to these things by way of saying that an underlying category, mistake that we make in looking at ancient religion is that we ourselves for a variety of reasons, and we ourselves now I mean to be um, global, secular, ecumenical American society made up of practitioners of a great many kinds of religious views, <clears throat> still have no consistent positions often even within the same religious communities on issues about the reality and the pre-existent reality of divine power and where you find it in the world. What we're better at talking about is communities and talking about groups of human beings and groups of human beings and the perspectives they bring that create the self-definition that enables them to understand themselves in the way they have chosen to be understood. The study of ancient religion turns out to be uh, of great value. We live with these ambiguities and these inconsistencies. <clears throat> And my view is that they are not to be resolved in our society and in our time until we can do a better job, a better job than we have done so before, of understanding and making sense of the way the ancient gods dealt with each other and who was inside and who was outside 
in those periods. Thank you.